Chapter 19, Sticky Notes. Chapters 19, 20, and 21 regard energy sources. Chapter 19 in particular is about fossil fuels. The case study is about the Keystone Pipeline, which is a very uh, famous or infamous pipeline that runs from Canada. So in Alberta is one of the provinces of Canada and they uh, get what's called tar sands or oil sands up here. And then they want to ship it down here to Texas because in Texas they have a lot of oil refineries that can turn this petroleum product into gasoline for our cars. The problem is, is that it runs over a lot of people's privately owned land and there's the possibility of uh, leaks in the pipe. And so it's become a very controversial um, pipeline that they want to build to transport. So why don't they just build refineries up here? Well, because they already exist down here because Texas used to um, pump huge amounts of oil um, from Texas. So they have a lot of refineries already built there. So it's cheaper to build a pipeline than it is to build refineries up north in Canada. So the type of petroleum in tar sands is called bitumen. And you need to know that particular, that this is the type of tar uh, petroleum product. So petroleum can be crude oil, which we sometimes call petroleum oil. It can be in other forms too. And it all is classified under oil for um, fossil fuels. So when we say oil for fossil fuels, we're referring to a petroleum product. Um, and so bitumen is a petroleum product. It's very thick and heavy and requires um, strip mining, lots of chemicals to liquefy it. It's huge amounts of environmental degradation and it has more greenhouse gases than regular crude oil. So crude oil is more liquidy. You, they have that in the Middle East and Saudi Arabia, even in Santa Clarita, we have crude oil being pumped out up by Golden Valley High School. Um, and this bitumen is another source of petroleum as we deplete other supplies of crude oil, we can turn to things like bitumen. But if you look on the other page, you can see the huge amounts. This used to be a forest and it's completely stripped and they're just taking the soil. The soil has the tar sands in it and they extract the tar sands out of the soil. All right, so the Keystone Pipeline over here on page 520 is controversial. It is a um, pipe built from Canada to Texas. And again, the reason why they want to do it to Texas is because there's already a lot of oil processing plants there. There is a lot of habitat loss with a pipeline. There's the potential for spills. And so um, people don't really want it going through their land. All right, on page 521, you need to be reminded of renewable resources versus non-renewable resource. So don't make the mistake on the AP test of saying a renewable resource is renewable. That's, you can't use the same word in your definition. So it's replenishable and virtually inexhaustible by human consumption. So about a hundred years or less to replenish. So, um, Soil takes about a hundred years. So soil is renewable. Um, so we say, but it takes a long time. Same thing with a forest. If you cut down a forest, it will grow back, but it takes 20, 30, 40 years to grow back. So we say it's renewable. <clears throat> Whereas non-renewable things do not form in a short period of time. And so it takes millions of years. So our fossil fuels, our minerals, our metals, those are all non-renewable. You need to know the all of these types of energy sources. So we will go through all of these in the next few chapters. You need to know that really we're talking about crude oil, which is also petroleum, natural gas, coal, and nuclear energy comes from uranium, and uranium is non-renewable. And everything else here is a renewable energy resource. You also need to know that most energy comes from the sun. Fossil fuels are just ancient living things and all living things get their energy initially from the sun through photosynthesis. So we eat plants, which get their energy from the sun. 
um, even if we eat animals, the animals eat the plants or producers like in the ocean plankton, phytoplankton, that get their energy from the sun. And then obviously solar does. Wind does indirectly because we have convection currents that are driven by solar radiation. And then the spin of the earth with the Coriolis effect makes winds. So the original energy source is solar radiation. Hydrothermal is from the sun because it's driven. Now hydrothermal is things like dams or any kind of energy we get from water. And um, the hydrothermal power like in a dam, it relies on rainfall and rain is created from the evaporation of water and condensation into clouds. And you would not have evaporation of water without the sun. And then biomass is trees or ethanol corn or living things that is burned. Um, and so that's photosynthesis. Now waves is even more indirect. So waves come from wind. So the wind blows on the surface of the ocean to create wa waves. And we know wind indirectly comes from convection cells, which is driven by solar radiation. So you have to know this. There are very few things on here that are not from the sun. Examples are geothermal, tidal energy is not from the sun, nuclear energy is not from the sun. All right, go ahead and turn the page on page 522. So this section of the book talks about um, the energy sources and consumption are unevenly distributed around the world. So um, it's not uniform. It depends on the region's geological history. So for example, um, the United States, we actually have a huge amount of coal. And same with China, we have very large reserves of coal. And um, we also have some uranium. Now, you, the United States is really big, so we do have a lot of natural resources. We do have some crude oil, but not like the Middle East does. The Middle East is concentrated with the huge amounts of crude oil. So it is not evenly distributed. And, and really, the wealthier countries have these natural resources in their country. So really from this figure and caption here, you need to know that the U.S. consumes the most energy um, of almost anywhere. Saudi Arabia does too because they have all that oil that they can consume. And um, up here that's Norway and they consume a lot as well. But really the U.S. Lead, US and Canada leads the world in energy consumption. On this page, you need to know what net energy is. So it's the energy returned versus the energy invested. So a lot of times it takes energy to get energy. For example, coal, we have to dig it out of the ground. And so we have to pay for machines, for workers, for the land to extract and, and to clean up the land when we're done. And so sometimes it's more expensive to get the energy source than the energy source is worth. And so um, that is a big factor as to what energy is being used in the United States. Right now, we have new technology fracking to get natural gas, which has made natural gas a lot cheaper to extract. And therefore, it's starting to replace coal as um, electricity sources in the U.S. You need to know what the EROI is, which is down here. It is the energy returned on investment. And so this is referring to similar um, thing that I just talked about. So there's other things that go into it. It's not purely open market capitalism. There's government regulations, there's availability, and the um, sometimes it's subsidized, so our government pays our tax money that we pay, we give to the coal and oil industry as just a gift to make coal and oil cheaper for people to use. Um, and that's called a tax subsidy. And so those things all, all influence what energy is being used as well. All right, on page 524, um, so here we talk about in this, um, we, we look at um, oil and gas in this country. It's become less profitable to um, 
to uh, extract the crude oil from our country, but it's, it's becoming more profitable with fracking for natural gas, but not crude oil. Because it's, we've depleted the easy, cheap resource ones, and now we've got to dig deeper, and so the, it's more expensive to extract it, and sometimes you don't make a profit. All right, so you also need to know that fossil fuels are most widely used um, because of established technology and transportation and infrastructure that make them easy to use and get. So how come we all haven't switched to electric cars or hydrogen power cars? Well, it's infrastructure. How many gas stations are there in the United States? Thousands, tens, hundreds of thousands of gas stations. And those would all have to be replaced with a different type of fuel, which is gonna cost a lot of money. Um, we also have the distributions all set up for fossil fuels, for transporting coal, for pipelines for natural gas and pipelines for oil. All of that stuff is already set up. So switching to a different energy power does take money to set that up. All right, um, let's talk about fossil fuels. So we went through some of the economic stuff in 19.1, which you have to know. Now let's go into fossil fuels and some information about them. Okay, so fossil fuel is organic matter. So the word organic means living thing. Um, that's broken down into anaerobic conditions or in anaerobic conditions, so without oxygen. So basically heat, pressure, and time makes turns living things into a fossil fuel. And we're talking millions of years. So this figure and caption here that you need to know, um, this shows how you have ancient swamp heat and pressure over time, and you get coal. And this is ancient plankton and other things, you know, ancient whales or whatever, sharks in the ocean, megalodon, whatever. Um, they, but most of the biomass in the ocean is plankton anyway. When you combine the whole trophic level of biomass and you weigh the whole trophic level, it's going to be vastly more um, plankton than anything else because you lose 90% uh, of your energy as you go up a trophic level. Okay, um, and so it sinks in heat and pressure over time, and you get um, your um, <clears throat> oil, your, so your petroleum product, and you get your, um, your natural gas. So oil and natural gas are mostly found together, um, not always, but very often they're found together. So crude oil and natural gas are very often found together. Okay, um, so coal burning in particular, the three main air pollutants are sulfur dioxide, particulate matter, and carbon monoxide. When you burn coal, you also release radioactive, radioactive materials and toxic metals like mercury, lead, and arsenic. So we discussed in chapter 14 how mercury becomes airborne and then rain brings it down to the ground and then... It washes into rivers, which go to the ocean, and then in the ocean, it goes up the food chain to with biomagnification and bioaccumulation to your top predatory fish like tuna and swordfish. And so um, the initial source of that mercury is coal burning, and that's a favorite question on the AP test. You also need to know that coal, oil, and gas reserves are usually found in sedimentary rock. So that's an important thing to know as well. You need to know that natural gas is um, composed of methane and the chemical formula or, um, uh, is CH4 for methane. You also need to know natural gas is the cleanest burning fossil fuel. So I, I forgot to write that here. So it's the cleanest burning fossil fuel. It has the least amount of CO2 and the least amount of air pollution. So if we're going to burn any fossil fuel, natural gas is the best. And in California, we don't really burn coal here. We burn a lot of natural gas, though. So it is better for the environment. It's not perfect. It's still a fossil fuel. It still does release air pollution and CO2, um, but not in the quantities of coal or oil. It is also the most efficient fossil fuel as well. And we'll continue on with the next video.